I know this sounds like a fairy tale, but I assure you it's perfectly true. The most wonderful day. You will hardly credit what I'm going to tell you, but thousands of our men will be writing home today, telling the same strange and wonderful story. This is history's most memorable Christmas. A celebration in the midst of slaughter. It's autumn 1914. The world is at war. German forces have invaded France and Belgium. Britain, through a series of alliances, is drawn into the conflict. The British army is sent overseas to help its allies fight back against the Germans. The first few months of the Great War were, were an incredible period. It's a clash of two mighty empires, the French and the Germans, and they both have their own plans. One, the Germans are going to sweep round through Belgium and crash into northern France, aiming up either side of Paris, uh, whilst the French are going to drive into their lost provinces of Alsace-Lorraine. Uh, so you get this sort of circular, almost motion. And those are the two great visions of what will happen. What does happen is it all goes wrong. The Germans had come sweeping through Belgium and into France uh, with, with their Schlieffen plan, the intention being to, to knock the French out of the war very, very quickly so that they could then turn and face the Russians on the Eastern Front. And the plan had failed. It had stalled on the River Marne where the, the French and the British had counterattacked. This is crucial. It forces back the Germans. They get to the Aisne. They start to dig in and from there race to the sea. It's, it's unbelievable. They're not racing to the sea, they're trying to outflank each other. These first few months are very different from our usual image of the Western Front. This is a war of movement. It's open warfare. Uh, there are no trenches, it's, it's fought in the open, obviously making use of whatever cover there was, so very often using drainage ditches at the side of fields, not proper big defensive positions. Nobody is expecting what's going to happen. They're, they're just crashing into each other. Not only is the nature of fighting different from the later war, the people fighting are different too. The image of the 18-year-old Tommy is completely false about the BEF in 1940. They are a much bigger range of ages. They, they are not 18. They're, they're, they're sort of, a lot of them are in their early 20s. Some of them are older. If you get the NCOs, they, they could be any age up to 40. And of course the officers would also be older. The British Army that goes to war in August 1914 was an entirely professional, regular army. There were no conscripts at all. These are all people who joined the army for a career. And the British Expeditionary Force were made up of all the battalions which had been on home service. And in peacetime, the home service battalions ran at just over half strength. So instead of a thousand men in peacetime, there'd be five or six hundred men. Which meant that when the war broke out, the numbers had to be made back up to a thousand. And the way that was done was by recalling men who were on the reserve. What it meant in practice was that almost a half of each of those battalions that go to France are made up with men who are out of practice, who might not be that fit, who certainly haven't handled some of the weapons or the equipment before. And so whilst the British Army does have incredibly good kit, it's certainly not the case that every single soldier that goes to France is in absolutely tip-top fighting condition. This professional army is already being decimated. By Christmas, the British have lost nearly 90,000 men, but the German advance has been halted. Their dream of winning the war in a swift, overwhelming attack has failed. Both sides dig in. From now on, it's a siege. How'd you end up in a trench? People often wonder that. Well, the, the, the thing is, you're not intending to be in a trench. What's happened? You're in a firefight with the Germans. They're shooting at you. You scrape with your little entrenching tool. You try and get anything, anything. Men will hide behind a blade of grass, they'll always tell you. But you just try and get that, that five or six inches down, put the earth in front of you, and then make it a bit deeper. Those first trenches come about when both sides literally can't get the better of one another so that both sides on the opposite side of a field uh, find themselves not being able to get any further forward and literally dig in where they are. And as time goes on, what happens is that they join them together. 
And so from these little personal scrape holes gradually develops into firstly a sort of a, a, a longer bit of trench, an outpost, and then they're joined together and gradually a front line develops. By November 1914, the trench network, if you like, has already started to evolve. It's still very crude. In most places, it certainly doesn't have the, the whole front line, support line, reserve line organization that we'll see later. Its main purpose, the, the main purpose of all trenches, is simply to make it safer for soldiers to live. The minute that you get below the surface, you're, you're out of rifle fire. Um, you can still be got by artillery, but it's certainly much, much safer uh, to move around in daytime if you can stay below the ground. So. The trenches evolve, they, they connect with other trenches, but it's still a long way from what we would think of as a very well organised proper trench with proper fire bays which come later. The Western Front we know is beginning to form. The soldiers are settling into trench life. It's a miserable, boring existence. Uh, what marks it out? A boring routine. Freezing cold. It, it's terrible. A typical day in the trenches in 1914 was very different to a typical day in the trenches later. Uh, for the majority of the war, most of the time the soldiers would work at night and they would sleep through the day because it was safer. But by the end of 1914, those lessons haven't yet been learned. So we still have a situation where soldiers are pretty much sleeping at night and then working during the day with all the casualties you'd expect of fellas being picked off by German snipers just because they suddenly get careless. You have to set sentries out, sentries watching over no man's land. Uh, the rest of the men, that well, during the daytime, often sitting there writing letters home uh, or attending to trench maintenance. And this is the, the day it is spent, the, the, it's just boring. Drainage in the trenches was often poor, making mud a constant problem. I used to think I knew what mud was before I came out here, but I was quite mistaken. The mud here varies from six inches to three and four feet, even five feet. And it's so sticky that my men used to arrive in the trenches with bare feet. Having cold feet isn't just unpleasant, it's a serious danger. Men are being sent to hospital due to frostbite and trench foot. This is soldiers just trying to make sure that they can keep their feet dry in, in really adverse conditions, taking the boots and socks and putties off at least once a day, drying them off, putting a drier pair of socks back on. That was a crucial thing because very, very quickly fellows would get trench foot if they didn't keep their feet dry. How do you keep clean in the trenches? Well, there's a bit of a problem. How would you keep clean in a trench full of 18 inches of water and mud? What they would do, they would, uh, they, they would get probably three inches of water in the bottom of the mess tin, which was what they called the D-type mess tin, because it was a sort of a, a D-shaped tin with a shallow lid. Um, half an inch of the water would be poured into the lid, and they would use that half inch to shave with. So you'd lather up your soap, you'd shave your face, Make sure that you rinsed off the razor in the top half of the mess tin so you didn't get any of the bristles uh, mixed up in the water that you're gonna wash the rest of you with. And then the two and a half inches left, you would use that to wash your face, you'd wash your hands, you'd unbutton your shirt, so you'd wash under your armpits, you'd just button it back up and dry yourself off. You'd unbutton your trousers, you'd have a rummage around and you'd do the same there, button yourself back up. And it is quite extraordinary because should you ever do this, which I have on numerous occasions, it's just like having a bath. It, you really do feel clean because what you've done, you, you've washed all the sweaty bits. So despite not having much water, every day the fellows manage to keep themselves as clean as possible. It's just as important to keep your equipment clean, particularly your weapon. Very often the image that we have from war films is these fellows completely and utterly caked in mud in, in First World Battles. But they would have to avoid that because the minute you do that, you'll be out of action within minutes. You won't be able to do the job. So obsessively, they would be cleaning weapons two or three times a day. Uh, all the rounds of ammunition would come out of the pouches, they'd keep those clean, they'd put them back in again. Because that sticky mud, the minute that you've got it on your clip of ammunition, you push that clip of ammunition in the rifle, you've pushed all the mud in with it, by the second or third round it will jam.
one of the high points of the day is mealtimes. Or perhaps not. In the trenches, you can forget hot food. You're not going to get hot food. What you get is standard British Army rations, and that is aimed to feed the body. It's not to feed the soul, that's for sure. British soldiers rarely cooked anything in their own trenches at this early part of the war for the simple reason that if you create any form of smoke, you will simply invite German artillery fire. So what do you get? You get uh, the staples. Bully beef, now, we call that corned beef now. They're sick to death of it. Uh, if you were lucky, you got a loaf of bread. Sometimes you'd get cheese and you'd get jam. Uh, always plum and apple on the Western Front. Uh, and the, this is all you got. Repetitive, repetitive, but enough to keep body and soul together. Does the army care about your soul? No. All they want is you fit to be able to fight. You've got enough calories, you've got the right sort of food to enable you to continue to fight for your country. And that's all they care about. To fill the time, soldiers would smoke, play cards, and dream of home. British soldiers were notoriously sentimental, so certainly most of them would have photographs of wives and girlfriends or, or family members. But those that could read and write would write letters endlessly whenever paper was available. I mean, it's very telling, really, that uh, a lot of the letters that still survive from British soldiers throughout the entire war nearly all of the surviving ones are the letters that they wrote home because in practice the letters that they received would very often be read numerous times before eventually being used when they went to the latrine. The night brought little relief. How do you get to sleep in the freezing cold? It, 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 it's so cold, you, you're frozen to the bone. Now that's an expression we use when we're waiting for a bus. This is frozen to the bone. Your legs are covered in freezing cold water. You can't take them out and put them somewhere dry. You've just got to stand there. So they literally sleep on the fire step. In some instances, they'll have built themselves crude shelters, you know, very often with doors at this stage in the war, doors taken off houses nearby, um, which won't stop shell fire, but might well keep the rain off. But most of the time they are just sitting on the fire step in the mud. You try and find a sandbag to sit on, and you put your overcoat over your head and try and make a tent of it. And you'd huddle down under that, just sitting down, but it was a very, very broken sleep. Sleeping is difficult in the front line. Very, very difficult. It's a horrible existence because you're so cold all the time. The men were exhausted. It's not to be forgotten how, how terrible an existence this was for the men at the front, because that explains a lot of what happens in, at Christmas 1914. Things were scarcely better on the German side of no man's land. Well, the daily life of a German soldier in the trenches at that period of time is very similar to that of a British soldier. Opposite the British regiments in Flanders and northern France in December 1914, a lot of the duty of the German soldier is devoted to somehow trying to avoid those trenches, to flood or to cave in. Uh, he's, he's busy extending and fortifying on what he has, and all that in addition of keeping an eye on the foe, uh, patrolling, uh, keeping everyone supplied. At this early stage in this area of the front, the deep and nicely furnished dugouts that many people associate with German First World War trenches do not exist. So um, life in the trenches in winter is freezing cold, it's very wet, hygiene is poor, and many soldiers suffer from, from bowel problems, for example. It's bone-breaking, physically exhausting, and mentally draining routine. Flanders is just one great morass, day and night, we stand up to our knees in mud and water. We have to wrap our legs up to our thighs in sandbags just to survive. On top of this all, this mad gun battle goes on across this forsaken plain, stretching out in front of us as flat as a tabletop, where it is dangerous even to raise your head above ground during the day. 
The Germans are now fighting on two fronts. Russian armies are pressing on their eastern border. French intelligence suggests the Germans are moving troops east to counter this threat. The French high command believes the time is ripe for an attack. Traditionally, campaigning stops for the winter because the days are too short, the weather's too bad, and everybody needs the opportunity to, to regroup, to, to rebuild their armies, to resupply, ready for the campaign the following spring. However, as so often in the story of the British Army in the First World War, the French, who are the dominant partners in our coalition, say that what they really need is an attack by the British to keep the pressure on the Germans. Because there's also a very real feeling that the Germans are now relaxing. After the first Battle of Ypres, they didn't push through, they were now just settling down for the long haul. And that was something that the British and the French really didn't want to happen. They were very keen to keep the Germans on their toes and not give them the chance to dig in, not give them the chance to improve their defences and to push them out as quickly as they possibly could. And the inevitable happened and they end up having to launch attacks with very little preparation, with very little artillery support. In December, what's often forgotten is that the French are still really intent on, on driving into the German lines. They launch a series of absolutely massive attacks. One on the 17th of December, smashing in the Artois area, that's near Vimy, and then uh, a few days later, they smash home again in, in the Champagne. Now, just to give you the scale of this, that's quarter of a million men attacking, supported by 600 guns in the Champagne. Just think about that for the moment. That's more than the whole British army and they're going over that's just one of two major attacks these attacks last for weeks they are smashing into the germans they are intent on trying to win the war break the lines and we are get back to open warfare By the time that these attacks are happening in mid to late December 1914, the British Army really is tired out. They've lost the majority of the old pre-war regular soldiers who've either been killed, wounded or captured in the first few months fighting. Uh, a lot of reservists have made up the numbers and when the numbers of reservists have finally run out, they're replaced with Kitchener volunteers um, who are having to be sent to regular battalions just to make up the numbers. The commander of the French, Joff, he doesn't order Sir John French, but he intimates to him that it is expected that the British will do their bit. They also will attack. What he wants is the whole BEF to attack. We water it down, then we water it down some more. We end up with just two battalions of 2nd Corps attacking. The poor old Gordon Highlanders and the Royal Scots, two, just two battalions, and that's all that goes over the top. Now, why is that bad? Well, if you attack on a narrow front, that means all the enemy to your right and all the enemy to your left can shoot into that area. Whereas if you attack on a broad front, it's obviously reduced. I've just come from the trenches where I had my first baptism of fire. I will never forget. When I saw my mates knocked over, I felt a bit giddy. The ground was in an awful state. We were up to our knees in mud and water, shivering with cold. This is terrible. And those two battalions are slaughtered. And you can picture the scene. When they go over the top, the whistles blow, uh, the bombardment, if you can hear it, because there's not that many guns and they haven't got that many shells. The bombardment stops and they go across no man's land. The Germans see you coming and they open fire. The tack, tack, tack of the machine guns. And then after a period, the shell fire starts. And the poor old Gordon Harlots, the Royal Scots, are slaughtered in no man's land. Men falling all round them. They're only two weak battalions, that's all that's going forward, and they are slaughtered. The attacks in December are an utter disaster. One battalion, the 1st Gordon Highlanders, loses 75% of their officers and over half their men, killed or wounded. And by the end, not one sector of enemy trench is in British hands. As soon as we went up, 
the Germans let us have it, and we were going down like raindrops. As our trenches was only 70 yards apart, we retired and then made the second charge but received the same. It's like being in a blacksmith's shop, watching him swing a hammer on red hot shoe and the sparks flying all around you. But instead of them being sparks, they were bullets. Some of the men that were wounded in those attacks were still crawling back or being rescued from no man's land two or three days later. Imagine being wounded, lying there, bleeding, unable to walk. How are you going to get back? Imagine freezing cold beyond belief. Imagine what it must have been like for those men. It is, it's difficult to imagine. It really is. I, 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 I've lost for words. It was a pitiful sight to see near our comrades dying and couldn't get out to help them as it meant certain death if we'd moved. So we had to lay there from 6.30 until 8.15 in the morning. And as an angel sent down from heaven, it came over very misty. And this being our only chance, we made good of it. So we crawl halfway and then make a run for it. I could not see where we were going, so fell over our comrades who were dead. The attacks and counter-attacks peter out in late December, leaving stalemate and stasis. Is there any good side to this? Well, yes. One thing is that people are watching. People like Douglas Haig, who was commanding uh, First Corps, and, and he was appalled by the nature of this attack. And when he made an attack, a nerve Chappelle thing still went wrong, but he'd learned. They attacked on a wider front. They had a bigger smashing barrage. Uh, they targeted known positions of German machine guns. They took out German mortars. They, they tried to suppress German artillery fire before they went over the top. They used aircraft to map German positions to target the shell fire accurately. So, the British Army is starting to learn. So even amidst the complete failures of those December attacks, the British Army was learning. But that is, that's no good if you've been killed or wounded in those attacks. The mood is depressed. Uh, there's no two ways about it. It's freezing cold. It, it actually starts to snow in this period. The mud and water in the trenches starts to turn into slush and ice. Uh, what are men feeling? They're feeling this war's not going to be over anytime soon. They can't see an end to the war. That means that they can't see an end to their personal torment. On Christmas Eve, the frost comes. The battlefield is transformed. The mud hardens, the puddles freeze. There's a thick morning mist. There is something in the air. It's even felt back at British HQ, who issue this stern statement. It is thought possible that the enemy may be contemplating an attack during Christmas or New Year. Special vigilance will be maintained during this period. The enemy are contemplating something, but it isn't an attack. We posted a tiny Christmas tree in our dugout. The company commander, myself the lieutenant and the two orderlies. We placed a second lighted Christmas tree on the breastwork. Something in the direction of the German lines caused us to rub our eyes and look again. Here and there, showing just above their parapet, we could see very faintly what looked like very small coloured lights. What was this? Was it some prearranged signal in the forerunner of an attack? Things really start to change on Christmas Eve. Now, why is that? The German family would celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve. That, that's when they would have the big meal. That's when they'd give the presents. A lot of the traditions of the German Christmas uh, are, are what we fondly think are ours. Christmas trees, that come from Germany. Christmas Eve, the Germans start to celebrate their Christmas. Their post is delivered from home, they've got their letters from their family, They're, that makes them feel warm even if they're freezing cold. Uh, uh, they've got, uh, they, they, they start to put up Christmas trees, they're sent lots of Christmas trees from home, they put them up in the trenches, they decorate them with candles. There's lots of accounts that there are Christmas trees appear above their trenches with lights and, and they start singing carols. How do the British react? Well, 
They're suspicious. Suddenly, lights began to appear along the German parapet, which were evidently makeshift Christmas trees adorned with lighted candles which burnt steadily in the still, frosty air. We were very suspicious and were discussing this strange move of the enemy when something even stranger happened. The Germans were actually singing. Not very loud, but there was no mistaking it. We began to get interested. Suddenly, across the snow-clad no-man's land, a strong, clear voice rang out. No other sound but this unknown singer's voice. Stille Nacht, heilige Nacht, alles schläft, einsam wach, nur das traute Hochheit. And, and then, you know, someone's singing Silent Night in German. Silent <laughs> Night. And they join in, they, they applaud, they start to shout things backwards and forwards across no one's head. Merry Christmas, Fritz. Merry Christmas, Fritz. Merry Christmas, Fritzy. Now, one thing that's interesting is a lot of the Germans could speak English. They're better educated than our lads, I fear. But that's not all. Many of them had worked as waiters or in butcher's shops uh, in London, in Manchester, in the, the great cities. There were lots of Germans who'd lived in England. And, and therefore, there was quite a bit of band. They could shout out across no man's land. And of course, the British, you know, cheery, chirpy, cockney style, would shout back. So you've got lots of people who say, how are you doing, Tommy? And, and then the British would shout, waiter, waiter. <laughs> because they've been white German waiters. And this sort of banter goes across no man's land. That, and, and that's going on on the night of the 20, 24th Christmas Eve. First the Germans would sing one of their carols and then we would sing one of ours. And I thought, well, this was really a most extraordinary thing. Two nations both singing the same carol in the middle of a war. Dearest Dorothy, just a line from the trenches on Christmas Eve. A topping night with not much firing going on and both sides singing. It will be interesting to see what happens tomorrow. My orders to the Koi are not to start firing unless the Germans do. Best love from your loving brother, Arthur. and they developed a warmer atmosphere than you might well have expected. Exactly as British generals had warned might happen if you live in close conjunction with the enemy. The Germans are there, they're clearly human. They are not the pickle howled monster. You can see them, they're over there celebrating Christmas. That, that's, that's not a monstrous thing, that, that's recognizably human, isn't it? On the German and British side, we can see men who share a deep cultural bond and who are not only fighting one another, but also share the same deprivations, the weather terrain conditions in a foreign country, um, or far removed from their families uh, and their loved ones at home. Uh, this is a cultural bond, and uh, that is the driving force for the Christmas truce. The goodwill on Christmas Eve is widespread, but there are sectors where there is no truce. One letter from an unnamed officer in the rifles shows a hostility bred from his traumatic experience over the previous weeks and months. I found the Bosch's trench looking like the Thames on Henley Regatta night. They'd got little Christmas trees burning all along the parapet of their trench, no truce had been proclaimed, and I was all for not allowing the blighters to enjoy themselves, especially as they'd killed one of our men that afternoon. But my captain, who hadn't seen our wounded going mad and slowly dying outside the German trenches on the Ain, wouldn't let me shoot. However, I soon had an excuse as when the Germans fired at us, so I quickly lined up my platoon and had all those Christmas trees down and out. And on Christmas Eve, a lot of Germans had put little candles in jam jars all the way along their parapets, and uh, uh, Colonel Scott Shepherd of the Worcesters refers to the, you know, his, his men shooting them out one after the other, which was the sort of true spirit, <laughs> Christmas spirit of 1914 in some places. Towards midnight, there seemed to be some commotion in the enemy trenches, and shortly afterwards, 
A lantern was raised above the enemy parapet. We were immediately ordered to open fire and thus what was undoubtedly a friendly gesture was brutally repulsed. And the French on the whole seem less keen. The Christmas truce is a collection of individual incidents that happen spontaneously all along the front line, mostly between the British and Germans, in some places between the Belgians and Germans, in some places between the French and Germans, although it's fair to say that because France and Belgium have been occupied by the Germans, they're not quite so keen on trucing as the, as the British are. The war diary of one German unit facing the French comments... On both days of the Christmas festival, the bloody game continued. Dawn, on Christmas Day 1914, it's another misty morning, and the British soldiers are getting their Christmas presents. Oh, thank you very much, mate. Go, mate. Happy Christmas. The British public and British industry responded fantastically to having their British expeditionary force in France and Belgium at the end of 1914. All sorts of companies provided um, gifts and, and, uh, and chocolate and, and, and woolen goods and comforts. But the most significant gift was the gift from Princess Mary, who set up a gift fund uh, towards the end of 1914 uh, to, to send a gift from herself and the women of the empire to all of those soldiers and sailors who were serving in, well, literally across the world at Christmas 1914. And it was a staggering undertaking because every single soldier uh, fighting on the Western Front received a gift and it fell into roughly two categories as far as the soldiers were concerned, which was about two thirds of them were for smokers and a third were for non-smokers. But for many, the true gift of Christmas Day is the peace. The silence seemed extraordinary after the usual din. From all sides, birds seem to arrive, and we hardly ever see a bird generally, which shows how complete the silence and quiet was. It was Christmas Day. It's foggy at the start. And what becomes apparent is you can see the Christmas trees, the German Christmas is the light. And gradually, the Germans start shouting across, and people start showing themselves. Inlander! And it's Christmas Day, you don't shoot them. And people get more and more bold on both sides. They're shouting out to each other, Tommy! And they're, they're gradually engaging, and gradually the bolder spirits start to climb out of the trench and wave, that kind of thing. And you get both sides starting to respond to each other. And then once you're visible, no one's shooting. So you move into no man's land. It's quite an amazing process. It involves an incredible amount of trust. And that's interesting, because they don't trust each other. So it, it's a strange phenomenon. As the soldiers emerge from the trenches, they get a clear view of their enemy for the first time. The British began to wave to us, and our men returned the gestures. Gradually, they left their trenches. Nobody thought of opening fire. That which only hours ago I should have thought was nonsense, I now saw with my own eyes. Truces were a very common thing in warfare and always have been. Both sides would often take the opportunity just to, to have a truce, to clear the battlefield, to, to bury the dead uh, and just take a breather. Um, but the Christmas truce was quite different both sides spontaneously in different places deciding just to stop fighting for a few days was quite unusual. Um, but I think that it's really important to say that it was of its time, and it was of its time because of the people that took part as much as anything. In many places, the initial motivation for the Christmas Day truce is to bury the dead. At about 9am on Christmas Day, an English officer, accompanied by two of his men, came across and asked for a ceasefire until midnight to bury the dead. This was willingly granted. The officer came out, we gravely saluted each other, and I then pointed to nine dead Germans lying in midfield and suggested burying them, which both sides proceeded to do. 
We gave them some wooden crosses for them, which completely won them over, and soon the men were on the best terms and laughing. And in at least one sector, the British and the Germans come together for one of the most memorable religious services of the First World War. With the dead buried, it's time to celebrate Christmas together. British and Bavarians, previously the worst of enemies, stood there shaking hands and exchanging items. Immediately one came up to me, shook my hand and gave me some cigarettes. Another gave me a handkerchief, a third signed his name on a field postcard and a fourth wrote his address in my notebook. Everyone mingled and conversed to the best of their ability. It was a moving moment. Between the trenches stood the most hated and bitter enemies and sang Christmas carols. All my life I shall never forget the sight. Just you think that while you were eating your turkey and that, I was out talking and shaking hands with the very men I had been trying to kill a few hours before. It was astounding. You will hardly credit this, but it is the truth. Fancy shooting at the Germans and going over to wish them a Merry Christmas. I don't think it's happened in the world's history before. You would have thought that peace had been declared. This was my first sight of them at close quarters. Here they were, the actual practical soldiers of the German army. There was not an atom of hate on either side that day. We just said how bloody it was in that mud, how we hated it all. They said, we are Saxons, you are Anglo-Saxons, why are we fighting? The Russians can't fight, the French won't fight, and you're the only people who do fight. Why are we doing this? We laughed and chaffed each other for about half an hour in no man's land. We shook hands, wished each other good luck. One fellow said, will you send this off to my girlfriend in Manchester? So I took his letter, franked it, and sent it off when I got back. A German lighting a Scotchman's cigarette and vice versa, exchanging cigarettes and souvenirs. Where they couldn't talk the language, they were making themselves understood by signs, and everyone seemed to be getting on nicely. Here we were, laughing and chatting to men whom only a few hours before we were trying to kill. There's an exchange of gifts. Now, what do they give each other? Well, I'm not, I think we get the better out of this, the British, because what happens is the Germans will give you cigars, or, or perhaps a German lager. What do we give them? Well, oh, tin of bully beef. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's a, a good exchange. But there's a small exchanges of gifts. Lots of them refer to cigars being given. And there are many, many photographs. That's why we know, there's never been the slightest doubt that this was a widespread process. Photographs taken, and, and that they engage in banter. Some of them de debate the war. That's not a good idea. <laughs> it doesn't generally go too well. The events of Christmas 1914 are, in my opinion, a clear indicator that the cultural similarities between the British and the Germans, and which include the shared Christmas tradition, were in many cases stronger than any kind of culturally driven hatred or state propaganda on both sides. Um, and you can rationally explain a ceasefire negotiation with the need to bury the fallen, but that doesn't explain why soldiers of the Bavarian 16th Reserve Infantry Regiment, for example, in which the young Adolf Hitler served, danced with British troops in no man's land. And it doesn't explain why in front of the lines held by the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division, many hundreds of German and British soldiers met up and mixed between the lines singing hymns and exchanging gifts and letters, or why group photographs of smiling German and British soldiers exist. By breakfast time, nearly all our men were on the ground between the trenches and were the greatest pals. We had a rare old jollification, which included football, in which the Germans took part. The most famous moment of the Christmas truce is the football match. But on this, controversy reigns. Football obviously crops up every time that the truce is mentioned. Um, and I think it's important to see it in, in, in context, in perspective really, um, because football actually plays a tiny, tiny part 
in the Christmas truce. All of those activities of sharing stuff, swapping buttons, swapping food, swapping photographs, all of that stuff's going on, singing together, drinking together. And only in a tiny, tiny handful of places is there any sign that the British and the Germans played football together. Now, football is something that is inextricably linked with the Christmas truce. The evidence for it is difficult to find. There are signs that there was some football play. Now, was there a big football match with, you know, 11 a side played over with rules, a referee and the rest of it? No, I can say that, no. Was there some sort of kickabout? Um, well, the evidence for this is mixed. Without doubt, there are some letters and diaries that mention football. Soon a couple of Englishmen brought a football out of their trench and the game started. This was also wonderful and unusual. That's also how it seemed to the English officers. That's indeed the effect of Christmas, the festival of love, that the hated enemy should for a short time become a friend. A huge crowd formed and we found a little rubber ball so of course a football match came on and we exchanged various things. So the evidence points to there being some football played on Christmas Day 1914, but nothing approaching a full game. The thing that always strikes me is that when you do see a big group of men playing football in a pretty much an open piece of farmland, even if you've got a lot of other men scattered around, it would have been a spectacle. It would have been seen by an awful lot of people and there would have been a lot more people writing about it. And in most of the accounts, they talk about all sorts of other things that they very rarely talk about football, which really suggests that, that football wasn't such a big thing at all. This means that you have to look at balance of probabilities as a historian, as someone who wants to know what happened. Can we be certain? No. Balance of probability, was there some sort of kickabout? Yes, I think there was some sort of kickabout, but that's all it was. Just a kick about. As Christmas Day draws to a close, the men shake hands for the last time and head back to their own trenches. They know the significance of what's just occurred. Even as I write, I can scarcely credit what I have seen and done. This has indeed been a wonderful day. Today we have peace. Tomorrow you fight for your country I fight for mine. Good luck. I left our friends on Christmas Day in a quiet mood. I stood upon the parapet and had a final look around, and not a shot was fired. One of the officers, a captain, clasped his hands together and looked towards heaven and said, My God, why cannot we have peace and let us all go home? The following few days see a gradual return to war. The ending of the truce is a bit like the start. It starts in many different ways across the line. And the ending, it finishes in many different ways at, at different times. So for some, it's just Christmas Day. And that's it. Next day, they're back to shooting. Um, for some, it lasts almost a week. Uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, how does it end? Well, it ends in many different ways you get a new battalion come into the line. Remember, the British are changing over all the time. New battalion arrives, we're not having any of this truce. Open fire, well, that ends the truce quick enough. Sometimes it's the guns, the Royal Artillery, or the German Artillery. <laughs> they're, not, they're not in the truce, and they open fire, and that ends the truce. There's a, a myriad of different ways it ends, but it ends everywhere, because the, it's not reality. The truce isn't reality. It's like, it's like a fairy tale. It's like a, an interregnum. It's, it's just a break in the real business of war. That's what they're there for, and that's what they get back to. It's ironic that an event that has had such an enormous cultural impact made absolutely no difference to the course of the First World War. When it came to it, the troops went back to war willingly. They'd enjoyed the truce. It had been a chance to do what they wanted to do. It's not a flowering of, of sort of the human spirit. It, it's not a, a, a sort of goodwill to all men. It's not any great love of the Germans. It is all about them. 
They've got what they wanted out of it. They've got a break. They've improved the trenches. They've got rid of them buddies. And now it's time to go back to reality. It's time to go back to war. The Christmas truce didn't happen again for a number of reasons. Um, apart from one very, very minor truce uh, with, with, um, with one unit where a couple of officers were given a hard time over it, in most places, the British Army had made sure that artillery would continue all the way through Christmas Day, that offensive you know, machine gun fire would carry on, that sniping would carry on, uh, to make sure that there was no conditions for the truce to, to start. Um, and in fact, it's it probably true to say that uh, there was probably more firing on Christmas Day than there had been you know, in some of the days leading up to it. But I think the other thing to remember is that by Christmas 1915, there was no taste for it either. Those pre-war regular soldiers, those hard-bitten regulars who just wanted to take a day off out of the muck and mud in 1914 had nearly all gone. So, you know, not that they'd all been killed, but many of them had been, uh, they'd gone home, they'd been posted to other units, they were training soldiers or, or they'd been captured. Um, but by Christmas 1915, the vast majority of men by that time in France were territorials or they were new army men of Kitchener volunteers, people who joined the army specifically to kill the Germans. Not a professional army who would have happily just as happily killed the French or the Belgians or anyone else, but people who specifically had joined the army to kill the Germans. And by that time, a lot of them were already in a position where they'd had friends or relatives who'd been killed. So they got no interest in meeting with the Germans for a truce. To many historians, the message of hope is overshadowed by the fact that the real peace is as far away as ever. I think one of the reasons why it's become so popular in, in the public imagination is that people have sort of fallen in love with a kind of romanticised version of the truce. Uh, people have got this idea, and it's often promoted, that the truce was somehow about man's humanity to man, and it was somehow about uh, peace and goodwill to all men. Whereas the absolute reality is that by the end of 1914, they are still mostly hard-bitten, regular soldiers. Um, that really, the men that Wellington referred to as the scum of the earth when he was praising his own army. These were hard-drinking, hard-fighting, hard-swearing professional soldiers. And they just seen the opportunity just to take a couple of days off. You know, to them, war was business. Uh, there was nothing personal in it. They, they got no dislike, real dislike of the German army. And because of that, it meant that you could just take a couple of days off. And then two or three days later, you'd have no compunction shooting the same fellas that you'd been chatting to and swapping drinks with through the head because it was purely business. It was, it was nothing personal. And I think that that's something that's often missed. You know, this, this was not man's humanity to man. This was a bunch of cynical, hard-bitten, very hard soldiers just taking the opportunity just to, just to have a couple of days off and a couple of days rest from all that misery and mud. When it comes to it, those people that they met in No Man's Land, that they were photographed with, that they shook hands with, they, they played football with, that those people, within a matter of days, they were willing to shoot at, to put a bullet through their brain, to burn it if it came to it. And that is the real human nature. That's, if you like, the blackness of the human spirit. You could see a man, you could shake hands with him, smoke his cigar, and you're perfectly willing to kill them. And yet, many who were there did report feeling something special, a brief interlude of peace that we remember to this day. The whole thing is extraordinary. The men were all so natural and friendly. The Germans have no bitter feelings towards us. It was a Christmas celebration in keeping with the command, Peace on Earth, and a memory which will stay with us always.